Joining us now is OG Okwe, with stories trending around the world. Hello, Genex. Oh, I was just going to say, what happened to Genex? <laughs> good morning. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you too. Good yes. morning, Tundra Biola. Good morning. How could you wonder what happened to Genex? <laughs> I knew it was coming. Well, it was only knew. a matter of time. You are going to hear Genex. <laughs> okay, good. Good morning, Rafai. Morning, Genex. <laughs> <laughs> I've registered that name, don't worry. This is so good, you. People no, are, no. People are calling for that. Okay, we'll do it next week. Mm, All right. Ojinika right. <laughs> is in charge. Okay. All right then. Well, good morning to you. Ojinika pepe dem, pepe dem. Ojinika pepe dem. Ojo, you tried so hard. Okay, okay. Pepe dem. Pepe dem. Pepe dem. Pepe dem. We'll try. Good morning to you, viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In the United States. World leaders will be back at the United Nations for the first time in two years today with a formidable agenda of escalating crisis to tackle, including the still raging COVID-19 pandemic and a relentlessly warming planet. While a new data is showing that the deadly COVID-19 virus has now killed as many Americans as the 1918-1919 Spanish flu pandemic did with an approximate 675,000 victims. In Japan, two sisters, Umeno Sumiyama and Kume Kodama, were certified on Monday by Guinness World Records as the world's oldest living identical twins at over 107 years and 300 days. The two sisters broke the record set by late Japanese twin sisters, Kin Narita and Jin Kani. In the United Arab Emirates, a news network, The National, reported on Monday that social media giant Instagram is allowing alleged Nigerian fraudster Ramon Abbas, otherwise known as Hush Puppy, to continue using his Instagram account of about 2.5 million followers. According to Instagram, Hush Puppy is free to continue using his account as he did not violate the social media platform laws. Under sports, Nigeria's female basketball team, D Tigress, has again displayed a dominant performance at the ongoing 2021 FIBA Women's Afro Basket in Yaoundé, Cameroon, after defeating Angola 85-65 in their finale group game. The team has continued in their quest to win the Women's Afro Basket Championship. Finally, under entertainment, Paul Rusesa Bajina, the man who inspired the film Hotel Rwanda for saving hundreds of his countrymen from genocide, was convicted of terrorism offenses on Monday, September 20th, and sentenced to 25 years at a trial that human rights watchdogs and other critics of Rwanda's repressive government have described as an act of retaliation. Reactions trail. What is your name? Ruse Sebegine. Paul Ruse Sebegine. I'll remember you. I'll remember you. Let's go. Hey, come on, come on. I'll leave you. Well, let's begin what's trending in the United Kingdom where an African-inspired restaurant, Ikoi, which was named after a district in Lagos, Nigeria, has become the first restaurant in the United Kingdom to top a world 50 best restaurant list. The restaurant set up by childhood friends, Jeremy Chan and Ire Hassan Odunkale, is already a one Michelin star restaurant. American Express also awarded the restaurant a one to watch award, which recognizes a restaurant considered to be a rising star on the global dining scene and also celebrates gastronomic excellence and innovation. Tundu Abiola, I saw how excited you were this when you saw the story. News. Great news from our I, Nigerian oh, brother. Wow, I'm so <laughs> proud of that. Yes. Not just because the restaurant is great, and it really is. Yeah. My real joy is just the fact that Nigeria is so represented in the UK, but mm. you don't get a sushi bar on every corner, you don't get curries in supermarkets, you don't get a Chinese takeaway 
every five seconds where you walk down the streets in London. I've always wondered why Nigerian food hasn't been properly marketed. I mean, the food in Ikoi, actually, I have to say, doesn't bear that much of a resemblance to the staples that we're used to. It's a fusion, and it's presented completely differently. But the flavors are there. The theme is there. The mm. name is there. Mm. So this is a win for Nigeria. And the fact that it's been recognized as the only British um, restaurant on that list, and it's not even British food. Mm -hmm. So that's a cool for us. Yeah, it's Great. amazing. I'm very, I'm so mm -hmm. pleased for them. All right, then. I mean, this is a big deal. It I mean, is. This is a big deal. And start right. of many things. Michelin star, that's a big deal. It's the start I mean, of I, many good things. Yeah, yes. I think he, Okay, let me put it like this. I think uh, the exciting thing for me is that, uh, you know, Nigerians are doing well in various ways. Uh, there's Jeremy, right, uh, who is not Nigerian. There's Iri Azan Udukale, the Udukales, they're very well known for yes. insurance. Mm -hmm. And now to see this uh, third generation, uh, or is this second generation uh, Hazan Udukale family, uh, you know, promoting uh, both Nigerian cuisine and continental cuisine in London, it's exciting. Now, each time you go to London, uh, and for many Nigerians, they want to eat uh, Nigerian food, they want to go to a Nigerian spot, Apart from Ikoyi, there's also uh, a place called Obalende, you know. Uh, Obalende Suya. Obalende Suya, Suya Sport, where you go to. There's a place uh, very close to uh, Peckham uh, called, uh, is it 385, they call it. I used to go there. and You could get a feel of Nigerian food. And then there's also Mr. Tunju Yelano's place, you know, that you can go to. Uh, very close also around Peckham, you know, that axis. So just as you find... Uh, places abroad where you can get Chinese cuisine. You can get, uh, there was one restaurant I went to that was uh, Argentine. You know, they eat a lot of meat. There was a lot of meat, Korean, you know. So it's good to see Nigeria, you know, or Nigerians also exporting uh, some of our delicacies. And I understand that Ikuyi, Tunu, you have been there. I have not been there. I will check it out when next I have the opportunity to go to London. That jollof rice. It's one of the uh, special I, items. I, I knew you were going there. You know, his, they, his, I, his I understand the subject of rice. What is your obsession with jollof rice, <laughs> Dr. Batsy? We have to ask. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, congratulations. Yes, congratulations. Uh, now that uh, that restaurant is uh, yes. listed, it just means that there are immense possibilities for Nigerians. For Nigerians. There are Nigerians yes. doing well in fashion, in football, mm. in uh, basketball, you know, and even now, you know, in uh, exporting jollof rice to the international community. Absolutely. You know, I think, uh, you know, congratulations are mm. in order. So mm. when I start in London, Ikuyi restaurant, I'll be there. Okay. Uh, you won't be there. So, okay, so, I mean, great one. Really very exciting stuff uh, that Nigerian restaurants are doing well. Uh, the list is endless where you can get Nigerian food everywhere. Uh, there's also Mamai Kaiti in Wembley back in the days, you know, big, big Nigerian food and all of that. But for me, I think the formative story is the fact that, yeah, it's a one Michelin star restaurant. Yeah. And it is time for us to start looking inward as regards our hospitality sector. And this is the time Nigerians too can set up something like the Michelin star, you know, to look inward towards our hospitality oh, sector. Oh, that's a good point. And help bring like that point. And because the truth is, how did the Michelin star thing come about? Edouard Michelin, they were tire makers. And they used to drive around the country in France to test out their tires. And apart from that, they started stopping up in different places, having food in restaurants, and they started rating that food and writing a review for it. The hospitality sector is suffering big time in Nigeria. The quality is low and all of that. Maybe if we sort of start up like a Michelin star thing, people that just go to restaurants, That's rate That's your them. task, Rufai. Yeah. Somebody you can should, start it should, up, yeah, really. Well, you know, the quality, you, the Rufai, hospitality is, and tourism <laughs> sector suffered worldwide yeah, in, in the context COVID, of COVID-19. COVID right, as well. And, you know, what every country is trying to do it's a recovery process. We hope that post the pandemic, that the Nigerian government will have a system in place, a strategy in place to support that recovery process. All right, then we'll take another story. Following the announcement of six Nigerians that the United Arab Emirates placed on its list as sponsors of terrorism last week, presidential spokesperson Femi Adeshina on live television on Monday said the federal government is not interested in naming and shaming them. The comment was made on the hills of President Mohamed Buhari attending the United Nations General Assembly on September 24th. Adeshina said that instead, the federal government's focus will be on the prosecution of the suspects. While Adeshina's comment has generated mixed reactions on social media, let's take some tweets. One's from Kingsley, who wrote, 
Wow, looks like sponsors of terrorism has the federal government's nudes. The same terrorists the federal government is spending millions to buy super Tokano jets for. If you are too timid to name their sponsor, how will you bomb the terrorists? Looks like we just wasted that jet money. I thought that was funny. <laughs> Another tweet from Coconut Head wrote, if you can't name the, those sponsors, then logically it's the federal government that's been sponsoring these terrorists with the country's finances. There is no better judgment than calling them out. That you owe to the general public. Tundu, do you, do you agree with Coconut Head? I mean, I know that they have listed, they, the United Arab Emirates wrote, I mean, gave us the names of those six people. Mm. Um, they gave the federal government a name. But I believe that the Buhari administration is just concerned um, in persecuting them as opposed to parading them in public or, you know, talking about them in the United Nations. You know, a lot of Nigerians usually confuse the law. So maybe you can try to, um, you know, educate us on that. Naming think, and shaming. Yeah, naming you know. and shaming for me is really beside the point. Yeah. You need to take it all the way. I think that um, Femi Adesino's comments might have been misunderstood here. What he's trying to express is that naming and shaming is merely superficial. Yeah. I think is what he's trying to say. I that so it's better too. to actually prosecute and get a conviction. Yeah. Because if the federal government were to name and shame and leave it at that, the general public will have this outcry and say, why have you only named and shamed? Mm -hmm. what, what happened to their day in court? Yeah. So I think what he's trying to express, and obviously the court trials are not going to be held in secret, are they? It's going to be public. Well, that's the misunderstanding. So, A yes. lot of people think that they're going to not. No, you know, because not if be they don't... If they're not publicized, then that is some kind of concealment so that's and some kind of coddling. Yeah. So I really doubt that that will happen. That's the issue. I think he's been misunderstood here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Dr. Abati, what about you? Well, I mean... Uh, Tuno is right. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, Femi Adesino is saying is what we've been saying consistently on this program, that uh, don't molly coddle, uh, you know, criminals, mm -hmm. terrorists. If people have committed a crime, they should do the time. Mm -hmm. It should be made, you know, to go through a due process. Uh, but the federal government says, oh, we have this program of reconciliation, rehabilitation, and uh, reintegration. And we've been consistent, unanimous, in condemning that. Yes. To say that, look, what is the guarantee that these terrorists that you mollycoddle uh, are truly repentant? How do you measure repentance? What is the quality of intelligence that you get from these people? And now, you know, um, another country comes forward to say, these six Nigerians yes. are major sponsors of terrorism in the world. Uh, what I expect the Nigerian government to do is to interface and then get the necessary intelligence and see how these persons, you know, can be prevented from continuing to sponsor terrorism in Nigeria. Since we all agree that terrorism is a problem to Nigeria, is, is a problem to the region, is a problem to the world, and it's a threat to the development, you know, uh, process uh, in Nigeria. So I think uh, Femi Additional saying this yeah. uh, is saying the right thing. Uh, but is that a position of government? Because his position would seem more or less to contra contradict, you know, the Jollof rice uh, non-kinetic <laughs> non <laughs> uh, approach <laughs> right. of the uh, federal government uh, that is busy suing Ashwebi uh, for terrorists and yeah. uh, uh, giving them handshakes and allowing them to take out of uh, uh, taxpayers' funds. Mm. You know, I don't want my taxpayers' uh, money to, to be used to buy a shoe before a terrorist. Me neither. Mm. Rufai, before I take your comment, in another development, Christopher Musa, theater commander of the Northeast Joint Task Force, Operation Hadinkai, has attributed the surrendering of many Boko Haram insurgents to prayers from Nigerians. The theater commander said this while briefing journalists on the fight against insurgency in the northern region. He further stated that the surrendered insurgents looked like part of a divine intervention and that even the insurgents were also baffled at their own actions as they were coming out in droves. Well, over 1,000 insurgents have surrendered to troops of Operation Hadden Kai, according to the defense headquarters. Rufai, your comment on this story. Prayers from Nigerians. So, so this is very laughable that a false man is saying prayers made them surrender. I mean, I believe in the efficacy of prayers, but let's not act funny in this country. These are terrorists, they are fighting. They're probably out on a mission to gather more intelligence. We've seen one too many times. We've forgiven them that have come out and surrendered, and they've gone back into the bush to harm Nigerian soldiers. 
So where's the prayer coming in here? It's a war strategy. Don't we get it? I mean, he's a general. He's in the field. He should get it. This is a war strategy. So people should be prosecuted if they have done wrong. What, what, what is... You see, we, we just do this prayer, 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 prayer thing. And that's why we've been praying so much and Nigeria has not moved forward. We've pr we pray too much in this country. And isn't it time to get to work? And secondly, I mean, maybe I'm the only one not getting the memo. They are financiers of terrorism. The Dubai government has printed their names they out. They have. The ones we've seen. Why can't we name them? I mean, can't we see the way America treat financiers? Don't they block their bank accounts? But we're so quick to name NSAS protesters and, and block their bank account. We, we, we all saw that, isn't it? Please, we want Nigeria to grow. We want it to be a country for all, but we must be fair to all. If people are engaged in this, you've seen them, you've gathered all the intelligence of them, you should be prosecuting them by now. But when some people took the NSAS protesters, they blocked their account, they did everything to them. We saw that. We it saw was that. Everywhere. So why can't you the news. So why public. can't you name these guys? So that, and put them, you can still name and shame somebody and still take and them to court. And and prosecute them. It doesn't stop the court process. Yes, so. Please, it's for all of us. And we them. want the country to do well. Yeah, openly. All right, shall we take another story? A video that captured a group of women in an alleged village in Kwara State digging up the soil with their bare hands, searching for drinking water, is making the rounds on social media. In the video, the women will have to wait for the filthy water to gather after digging up the soil before they collect it. Let's take a look. Um, this is how they dig water here. This is the source of their water. This is how they get water by digging hole. After digging, when it accumulates, they will now start fetching. As you can see, she is about to fetch the available one. And an individual has to do a hole before getting water. You see how dirty the water is. During dry season, it takes more than five hours to get something like this. Tundu, this made me really sad when I saw this video. Well, I hope this video is completely legitimate. Well, I'm not, we're, I've not identified this exact location, but you can hear from the person who filmed it that it sounded like a, a, you know, a language from Kwara State and is a, you know, alleged to be in Kwara State. But this is so appalling. This is Nigeria, Tundu Abiola. I'm not sure what language that is, but whether or not it's in Kwara, this is a common story in Nigeria, yes. and that fact cannot be denied. I just denied. want to call out yeah. that state, if that's... Because I've read similar stories about yeah. Kwara State yes. specifically. There was one that I read about a Malete um, water works that was commissioned by the Minister for Water Resources, and that the tap worked for one day, the day of the commissioning, and the next day it was back to getting water from a dirty stream. I keep hearing the same thing. There's another part of Kwara where people have to walk through two different towns to be able to access another filthy stream and get water there. So, and it's also been the case in Jigawa State that the government made this announcement. I was so excited. Oh, wow, we have 90% um, of our residents can access potable water. The residents said, no, actually, we cannot. That's not true. So this is a problem in Nigeria, and it's such a disgrace. Are we serious about sustainable development goals? 2020, 2030, it's just around the corner, goal six. Is mm. access to clean water for all. What is this? This is appalling. Dr. Abati, your comment on this story. Okay, yes. First, um, you know, access to water is a major problem across the world. And you've identified it, goes of the uh, sustainable development goals. And in Nigeria, the access to water is such a major issue because it's linked to other things. And that's why Nigeria, in collaboration with the United Nations, has uh, what we call the WASH program, right? Mm. Uh, water, sanitation, and hygiene program. And it's 
very unfortunate that in many parts of Nigeria, you know, access to portable uh, uh, water remains uh, a problem. This particular community that you showed on screen is uh, Dagbalodo community. That's what they allege, yeah. In Lafayette, uh, you know, uh, local government area of uh, Kwara State. That's what they allege. And Dagbalodo, if you know the, uh, uh, you know, interpretation, the translation, the literal translation in Nigeria, you know, uh, in Yoruba, is quite ironic. Uh, these people, you know, they are not growing up around water. They are suffering from lack oh, of access to potable water. God have mercy. And nobody in God the 21st century, you know, should be subjected to this kind of situation. Yes, that, uh, you know, uh, dirty water you are seeing there, they will go and boil it. And, you know, of course, if you don't have access to potable water, there are implications mm -hmm. in terms of health. Health. Uh, so what we can do is to call on uh, Governor Abdul Razak of Kwara State to take this uh, seriously, to identify the location, and to see what, uh, you know, he, uh, he can do for the people. Mm. Or maybe any representative from that part of Kwara State uh, mm. can do it. And when Easy. they make the effort, maybe to dig a borehole, mm. simple borehole for the people, we don't want to see the pictures. Because no. Nigeria is probably the only country in the world where right. politicians dig boreholes and they spend more money promoting the uh, uh, commissioning of the borehole uh, more than the, the amount that was originally spent on the project. It's very sad. It is sad. We've come here, we've talked about it over and over again, but nothing changes. And that's why we keep hoping and praying that this country gets better. Oji, I want to ask you, we all live, you know, on the island. Do we have access to portable water? No, to, like all, sta all the states in Nigeria, so, so we if, don't have 24-hour so running if this water is supposed in to be Nigeria. Really? One of the highest real estate market, and we can't get government running water. Yeah. Then this to show you that this is the case with Nigeria. The only difference between us and these people, Audrey, is the fact that they can build a borehole. We can put a borehole that the Lagos state government will still charge us for putting. They will not give us portable running water that we can buy from them. They will still charge us for putting a borehole in the house. So that's the problem with Nigeria. The question is, can we solve it? Yes, it can be solved. It can be salvaged. Mm -hmm. But are we ready? I don't think currently we are. Well said, Rafai. We'll take another story. More videos are emerging showing the deplorable state of some major roads in different parts of Nigeria. Here is one of such by a man in Ogun State who says even animals wouldn't survive successfully in his community. Honestly, this is becoming a sat satanic attack on our community. Look at container. This container fed and God saved that vehicle we are looking. Look at it. Look at the deplorable state of our roads. A woman, look at it. Our roads are not passable anymore. This, this is crazy. This is some go via underbridge, some go to Gongon. Look at it. One way, everywhere, everything is in disarray. Look at water, look at lagoon. Look at that container, look at this vehicle coming, look at the way everything is messed up. This is crazy, this is unbe unbearable. Animal cannot even live successfully in this community any longer. And this is where you are generating income to sustain the entire state and have become an abandoned arena, abandoned avenue. And you have people representing us in Ado Dota. And they are all there in Abekuta making money. When most of them are jobless. When they don't have the professional certification that can make them money themselves. Except when they meet from the government pocket. They can't talk. They can't say anything. Because this is this is un un unbearable. Look at it. I will go to less place, you are. Nilu that in generate revenue to sustain the entire state, even the nation. What is the meaning of this madness? Well, here is another video. This one is from Anambra State. The man in this video alleged that a private individual even offered to repair the deplorable road, but was told to stop by the federal government. Let's take a look. Hello, my people. I am right now in Anambra State. This road you are seeing, and this, if you are coming from this way, you are coming from Enugu. To Onicha. And this is this is Oka, this is Amansi in Oka Anambra State. Amansi in Oka Anambra State. People have been on this road now for the past seven days. Just watch. You see what people are suffering to enter here. This is from Enugu to, to Oka to Onicha. Enugu to Onicha, just watch. 
Just watch. This particular uh, uh, stores here were brought by Stanel to provide some kind of relief for the commuters. But, but Fema came and warned him not to. So you can, you can see how we cared, how we cared people are. Somebody with his own money wanted to help. Fema, federal government warned him not to put on it on his seat. He abandoned it. Stanel, Stanel was the one who brought this here. He abandoned it. This is, this is Aman Sioka. Will you, Ndigo, Hopus or the mother said they have done this road. Silkedness. Oh, Audrey, the part I don't get is this. The fact that this road is such in a deplorable state that a private individual says, please let me fix it. And the federal government says no. I, I don't know if there's something they need to explain to us because that's Songo Road. A certain private individual, I hear a pastor of a church, I mean, when he's done good, let's say he's done good, uh, Bishop David Oedeko offered to fix that road because that road leads to Kenna land in Songo. But they said, no, he shouldn't do it. That's a federal road. So I think the part I don't get is, why will private individuals say, let me salvage the situation, let's fix the road, and you tell them as government or authorities of government not to fix it, and you, you allow people to continually live in this deplorable state. This is Songo. Well, Terrible. I was there last it, this week, I believe. In terms of uh, Same thing happened to me. the infrastructure crisis that mm. we have in Nigeria, and many people comment on uh, Nigeria's excessive borrowing from doing salami uh, to the uh, man on the street. Say, okay, if we keep borrowing and we say we're keeping money in the uh, sovereign uh, uh, you know, investment uh, fund, uh, what do we get in return? The people don't see the evidence. The Songo Road, in particular, has been like that since the time of President uh, Olusha Gwambasunjo. President Obasanjo left government in 2007. Now, the basic argument is that these are federal rules, and states do not have the enough resources to spare uh, to take a look at these rules and fix them. So there's this dichotomy between state rules and uh, federal government rules and local government uh, uh, rules. And you'll recall that one of the highlights of this administration is that at a point, after paying so much money to Kogi State and Oshun State, I think, uh, the federal government said, look, don't touch federal roads. There is a policy in place like mm -hmm. that. So the state governments themselves are handicapped. And I know for sure that with regard to that road, some go to Igongon Road. Uh, the present governor, you know, is willing to fix it. Mm -hmm. But perhaps he has not been able to get the relevant uh, cooperation uh, from the federal government, despite the fact that the government in place in Ogun State is APC, the government at the center is APC. So that policy, can we take a second look at it? If there are governors who want to do it, should they be allowed? If there are private persons, once they are not making demands, you know, can they be listened to? Right. Uh, can, can they be listened to? Well, thank you, Dr. Mm. Bati. Thank you. That's all I have for you on What's Trending Today. See you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Genix.